Hello, you're through the books, boys. You've got Dean on the line. Who's calling? You can go ahead and introduce yourself. Me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh, I thought you were talking to the people online. Hi, I'm Sue Salinger, and I am the author of Sidelined, How Women Manage and Mismanage Their Health. This is what it looks like. I don't know if mm -hmm. we're, I guess we're on there video. We Thank you. Um, took me about 10 years to write the book because I did a lot of research. Mm. Um, and it was just a very enjoyable experience. I talked to about 40 or 50 women with different diseases to see what, if anything, what behaviors they had in common. And I was able to isolate five or six things that women do or decisions women make that really do us a disservice. So that's what the book is about. It's about the hurdles women have to jump. I mean, you can tell it took a long time because, you you know, the, when I first looked at it, I thought, OK, it's a small it's a small book, you know. But then I look <laughs> right. at it. Oh, there's a lot of research in this. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, references and cit citations and things. And right. of course, you spoke to all these people over a period of years. You went back and spoke to a couple of them then at the end of the Thank project you. to see how they were getting on. So it right. looks like a lot of work went into this. A lot of work did go into it. And I found much to my surprise that one of the things that women do is that we put ourselves last when it comes to our own health. Mm. There was a study done where researchers gave women a list of, of five things to prioritize to see you know, what they would care for first. And the first thing we take care of are our children, then our pets, if you can believe that, <laughs> then our parents or significant others, then our, our I've forgotten, oh, our significant others, and then five, I mean, last, every woman put themselves. themselves. It's so the, the, the children, I suppose, doesn't surprise me. Putting the pets before the significant <laughs> others is, is uh, an interesting one. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, let's see. I don't think I'm feeling so hot, but my poor iguana really needs to go to the <laughs> And, you know, that did that surprise you or was that what you thought you would find? No, it actually, it did surprise me because the reality is you can't take care of others unless you're feeling good. I mean, if you're feeling like crap, how are you going to help other people? I mean, it's yeah. really, even the airlines tell you to put on your own mask. I was about to say that. Yeah. yeah. Help yourself first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it seems self-evident. So yes, I was surprised. I really was. Yeah. Um, and I think that that really does us a disservice because something that is not serious, if we wait long enough, could become serious. So that's yeah. not good. And that is, I mean, that is something that you, you do mention in the book. It's not not dealing with things on time. Um, right. And putting right. off going to the doctor. You've, you're busy in the house. You've got the kids, whatever. The next exactly. thing, your issues become twice as bad as it would have been if you if yeah. you just set the time for, and prioritize yes. yourself, you know, and that's... Right. So... That, that is interesting, you know, and the first, I mean, you can go through the chapters, but like there's one chapter, the very first one after you. So that's talking about that. It's about the fact yes. that they don't put themselves first. And that's, that's a shame. I mean, let's, let's look at this. What do you want people to take from this? So for, for a woman reading the book, you know, what do you want the takeaway to be? I want the takeaway to be that even though we think and we do frequently take charge of our own health, we have to do even more. We have to feel empowered. We have to have the courage to question our doctor, to get a second opinion. Women hesitate to get second opinion. Mm. Men don't, women do, uh, for a variety of reasons. And we have to have the, how can I just say the guts to say to the doctor, listen, you know, I, what else could this possibly be? I need to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of, a lot of, I guess, just courage and in, it's, you, you want to be empowered. It's your body and you yeah. really need to take care of it. That's the message. Mm. The second opinion was interesting to me because with the health service that we have in the UK, typically, because we're not, we're not paying, right. we don't, we don't see it as a consumer thing. So right. I think we just go in and we, we take the doctor's word for it and it would never occur to us well, I'm, you know, I'm buying a service, I want a different opinion or something. And I think that right. we would be even maybe less likely here to ask that's for a second opinion, you know? That, that's a cultural difference. Because yeah. in the States, uh, men do get second opinions much more readily than women. Mm. You know, and I, I'm sure this is true in Ireland too, but we're brought up, you know, to play nice and not be rude. And we don't yeah. want to hurt the doctor's feelings. And what if he gets angry and then labels us a bad patient and mm -hmm. or hysterical, which women still get quite a bit. Uh, one that surprised said, me to read. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I was surprised too, actually. 
you know, it's just, it, it's difficult for women to do. And mm -hmm. also in, in here, it takes more time. It means another trip to the doctor. And I'm sure. assuming you have transportation and the financial resources and access to doctors. If you live in the country, you may not. Exactly. Um, but let me, let me ask you something. Do you think that a woman is more likely to ask for a second, you know, if the, if the doctor is female, do you think that makes a difference? I don't know. Uh, yes and no. And I'll, I'll be <laughs> asked me that all the time. And actually, there's so much research on whether w women should go to women doctors or men doctors. Uh, and there's a, there is a difference. And the, the jury's kind of still out. Um, women doctors just have a different practice style. Mm -hmm. They do talk more. So you, you may talk, be yeah. more like, yeah. They spend more, more, more sort of yeah. average they, minutes they, per session yes, they do. talking. They absolutely do. And a man doc, a male doctor is much more, um, I guess, biologically oriented. He wants to know about your symptoms and it's much more business-like. So mm -hmm. in a certain sense, it depends where you're most comfortable. I mean, if you're on your lunch hour and you want to get in and get out, you need to go to a male doctor. <laughs> If you have time and you really want to establish a relationship, uh, a female doctor may be better. So it yeah. really just depends. What you really want in a doctor is competence and you also want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. If you're not comfortable, you won't talk about your symptoms. You won't ask questions because you're sure. not comfortable. Another big takeaway I had was you mentioned that similar to the, the women doctors being more open to having a longer conversation, the female patients are actually spending a lot more time, I guess, with a preamble before they say what's wrong, they're giving how it's affecting them in the house with the whole right. lifestyle. Right. Whereas the male patients kind of come in, here's the problem. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, and, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the male patient will go in feeling like he's part of a team where in the, you know, he, he and the doctor are going to solve this. Yeah. But uh, the female patient doesn't do that. And I honestly think that the different conversation styles, which incidentally are so evident that when <laughs> a bunch of cancer patients were given, asked to write letters about their experience, and then the letters were submitted to a bunch of, of interns. Mm -hmm. And the interns were able to tell which let most of the time, over half of them, which were letters were written by women and which written by men. Yeah, that surprised female, me. Yeah, it did me too. <laughs> uh, frankly, it did. But the females were, I mean, the women's were just more vivid, more full of feelings, mm. more, more involved, more, it just was a, a whole different uh, level of, of, I guess, feelings. And I think that that's part of the problem because I'll, I mean, I don't know how you are when you go to the doctor, but I'll go in and I don't know, let's say I have a sore throat and then I start, I'll tell them my throat hurts or her. I mean, of course I will. But then I say, you know, and I'm really tired and it makes it so hard for me to drive the kids around and I can't do this. And I've got this thing mm. to it. Work, and I'm so stressed all because I don't feel good. And my sore throat gets kind of lost in the morass of all of these yeah. emotions. And I think it lends, it, it can mess up the diagnosis. It's, it seems that, yeah, unless the doctor is, is expecting that or is aware of you know that that he might need to pick out that information um particularly with as you say with a male doctor whose communication style might be different there's misdiagnoses and or or delayed diagnosis and that's right. a problem you know yeah it's better to go in with just a list of your symptoms i mean not that you shouldn't talk about your feelings of course you should mm. but you just want to make sure that you focus the interview and control the interview so that you get what you need you're not there because it's hard to drive carpool you're there because your throat hurts um, yeah exactly exactly another thing that surprised me was the turning inward chapter about basically that women are sort of blaming themselves almost like and you talk a little bit about almost a it's almost a moral aspect and you you know yes. and we go back historically to this idea that you know if you if you've gotten ill it's some kind of punishment and that that kind right. of mentality to to maybe a, an extent still lingers a little bit that's that, that's that's interesting well and that was actually the thing that surprised me the most mm. in all of my interviews because i don't get that way when yeah. i get sick i get pissed off i ashamed doesn't even occur to me i'm just i get enraged i mean it's ridiculous really <laughs> but what what i learned was that a lot of the women base blame their illness on on their stress if i had just taken more naps or if i had exercised like i should i wouldn't be under all this stress and then i wouldn't have fallen ill so what happens is because they're blaming themselves and their stress they see their illness as almost a public manifestation of their inability to manage their lives. Mm. See, I'm sick. I can't manage my life because I, I'm under so much stress. 
And I think what I, another takeaway that I really want women, well, and for that matter, and men, um, illness is random. I, I mean, certainly stress contributes to illness. I'm not in any mm. way saying it doesn't, but it isn't the only reason. I yeah. mean, some smokers get lung cancer and some don't. And some alcoholics get liver disease and some don't. I mean, I tell the story about my father-in-law who ate nothing but red meat, smoked cigars every day, never exercised. And his blood pressure was never as high as yeah. mine. And I do everything right. I mean, go, <laughs> you know. There's an so, element of luck in that as well. or, or oh, random And genetics. Like, I mean, yeah. there's all kinds of things, really. Yeah. I mean, I've been under tremendous stress at various times in my life, and I don't get sick very much. Why I wrote a book on illness is a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's the question that I, I was going to ask you next. So, because you put a lot of work into this, why did you start to do it? You know, what, what motivated you to undertake the project? Well, my lack of courage and empowerment, I had a very unfortunate experience where I had been taking some hormones for menopause and all that stuff. And the doctor said, there's some new hormones on the market. Why don't you try them? And I, sure, you know, not a problem. So I took the new horm hormones and then I started some vaginal bleeding, which of course scared me to death. And I wanted to go back on the, my old regimen. And the doctor said, no, 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 no. We have to do all kinds of tests, which he did and everything was fine. So then he said, well, we need, you need to have exploratory surgery. Something's not right. And I knew he was worried about ovarian cancer. Mm. That's what he was thinking. And I was a younger mother with young children, you know, and I, I he, if he had been right, he would have saved my life, but he wasn't right. He wasn't. And I knew that it was, I just knew it was the hormones because I know my body and I'm susceptible to medications. Mm. So as they're wheeling me into this freezing cold operating room, I thought to myself, woman, what were you thinking? Why are you here? What in the world? Why am I here? It's ridiculous. Yeah. So anyway, I had the surgery. I was fine. There was nothing. I went back on the old hormones, as I said. And then I just started talking to other women to see if any of them had made decisions that they regretted. And I, I think I said I talked to 40 or 50 women and almost all of them had at one time or another messed themselves up in that way, done themselves a disservice. And so that really led me to do some research. I, I, after I talked to these women, I extrapolated the five or six things that they all had in common and then did some research to see if there was any literature, you know, backing up, backing yeah. all this up. And there was a ton. Um, that's what took me 10 years because there was so much literature. A lot of, and I, yeah. to go through it. <laughs> I, I would have preferred there'd been a lot less, you know. <laughs> And then near the end, my favorite part, actually, because I, as a historian, you know, I studied history in university and, and Greek history, especially you do an unfortunate history. And we just we get a little recap of like these kind of problems with exactly. women's health throughout time, starting with ancient Greece and through yeah. the medieval period and Renaissance oh, and right up to the modern yeah. day. Yeah, I yes, love that. I, I loved it. <laughs> I just loved it. And I think that the, our history, women's history with the medical profession is really a pretty unhappy one. I mean, and it transcends cultures. So the Chinese called called daughters maggots in the rice. And the Dutch had a proverb that a house full of daughters was like a cellar full of sour beer. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be Greek or Egyptian or whatever, you know. But they women's bodies have just always been considered pathological. Uh, they're the reasons our, our, our reproductive systems are the reasons for our inherent instability. Um, with they it's really been a very unfortunate very unfortunate history and i think that part of the problem is that some women have internalized this and i think that it's framed the way we think of our bodies in the present we we, we just think we're of aristotle called us mutilated males I yeah <laughs> I know. that's wild I mean, yeah yeah i know it's wild and so I think that we think of ourselves perhaps as poorly designed, you know, and we, we need like a, a refresh, you know, just want to push a refresh button. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's really contributed to some, some of the things that women believe about themselves, their bodies, their illnesses. You can't really, uh, James Baldwin once said, you know, we carry our history within us, it's present in all that we do. And I think that that's true. Yeah. Um, I wish we could just dump it, but you can't, you know. And is there going to be another book or is that, was this, so, you know, you wanted to do this one book and that's you? Well, I think there may. I'm just toying around with a couple of ideas. I was going to do maybe something on women and, you know, illness and shame. But mm. Brene Brown has just done a great, a, some great work on that. So I don't know if I want to even, I think the field may have been covered. I have right. to, And I also want to do about the invisibility and the loneliness of illness. 
Mm. I don't know how much more time I have, but one of the things I, I really discovered, I put together a couple of focus groups because I wanted some geographical diversity. And in the, in the focus groups, none of the women had ever talked about their illness with anyone other than their doctor. And that also kind of blew me away because I mean, yeah. I'll tell everybody and you want ask me how I am and I want to go, you know, how much time do you <laughs> have? You know? But these women hadn't said a word. Wow. And so I was very surprised yeah. about that. Um, they were so happy to be in the focus group and meet other women, although with different diseases, but still similar issues. Mm -hmm. The book is really talks about the behavior of, of women much more than the illnesses. Um, okay. It doesn't focus on the particular mm -hmm. illnesses only because there's a ton of books on that. Sure. Um, good ones that there's no point competing with. Mm -hmm. But so the loneliness and the invisibility of it really fascinates me. And that's, that's probably where I'm going to go. But I'm so busy marketing this one. I haven't had a chance to yeah. do it yet. Well, why don't you market it for us now? Where can where can people go to get this book? You can go to it's available at Amazon in the UK and it will be on um, I think it's May 26th. But it's it's available in the States now. You can go to my website, which is susansalinger.com, and that's S-A-L-E-N-G-E-R.com, and it gives you all the sites where you can buy the book. Cool. I'll so put a link anyway on the in the show notes. Oh, thanks. And and you've got a lot of books behind you by the looks of things. You've got a full bookshelf. Oh, I, there. Well, I I love research. I just <laughs> love it. And these are actually journals, Journal of Women's Health, right. Sociology of Illness. And a typewriter. Are you do you do you write on the typewriter when you're writing? No, your no, no, no. This is an antique typewriter oh, that my okay. daughter gave me for my birthday. I think it's almost from the early 1900s. Wow. And my husband traced it back to to the original owner. I mean, it was really fun because we were going to give it back to them. We thought maybe they would want it oh said, nice yeah no they said we could keep it lovely so I give it there to remind me that i don't have to type it <laughs> i love my computer it's Brilliant. fabulous well yeah. susan it's been a pleasure to have you and uh, as i said i'll put a link in the show notes to your website and uh, hopefully people will check out the book thanks for thanks calling so in so much and stay out of the rain <laughs> i will stay out of the rain <laughs> thanks a lot. all right bye-bye all right bye-bye